Next item of business is consideration of business motion number 14616. In the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a revision to the business programme for today, any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 14616. Formally moved. Thank you. No member is asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 14616 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is topical questions. And the question number one, Jim Hume. Uh, thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Audit Scotland report, NHS in Scotland 2015. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. Audit Scotland's report mirrors our own assessment on the need for our NHS to evolve to meet the changing needs of Scotland's people. The report recognises that we have increased health resource spending in real terms and we will continue to increase the frontline NHS budget, at least in real terms, for the next Parliament too, should we be re-elected. The NHS has made substantial progress under this Government and Audit Scotland's report highlights a record high workforce, providing a variety of high quality services, support and advice, which have contributed to people living longer, along with continued advances in diagnosis, treatment and care. On A&E, the statistics for the last two full months show that Scotland is performing above 95%, not matched in any part, other part of the UK, and hospital waiting times have been transformed and are at historically low levels under this government. The median wait for a hip replacement has reduced by 87 days, for knee replacements by 93 days and for cataract operations by 44 days. On patient safety, the statistics for C. diff infections in patients aged 65 and over has reduced by 84 per cent and MRSA has reduced by 88 per cent. Finally, this Government has a clear vision for the future of our NHS and will take the right action to ensure that we continue to have an NHS that Scotland can be proud of into the future and now. Jim Hume. I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for an, an interesting reply, but I think most people were actually shocked to learn from Audit Scotland that the SNP have actually cut health spending in real terms since 2008, even though health spending has risen in the rest of the UK. What this is, is a regressive agenda. This is the exact opposite of what the Scottish Government has been telling us and is still telling us. So in trying to fix this backdoor austerity from the SNP, will the Scottish Government address why nine of the 14 health boards are still below their funding, with some forced to request loans to meet their commitments? Cabinet Secretary. Well, if Jim Human actually read the Audit Scotland report, page 10, page 10... Page 10, between 2008-9 and 2014-15, the revenue Dell budget increased by 2.2 per cent. Uh, that is from the Audit Scotland report. Of course, what Jim Hume has referred to is the capital budget included, which, of course, given that when he was part of the UK yeah, yeah, government, yeah, yeah. cut Just the Scottish day. government's capital budget by nearly 25 per cent. So, yeah, yeah. of course there was going to be a consequence for health capital. But the frontline spend for our hospitals, our doctors and nurses, that frontline spend has increased in real terms. Now, Audit Scotland clearly lays out challenges for us. And as I said in response to the report when it was published, we absolutely recognise that we need to increase the pace of change, particularly in implementing the 2020 vision. I've made that clear. But I would hope that some opposition politicians might be able to bring themselves to recognise that the Audit Scotland report actually says that the resource spend has increased in real terms. Will Jim Hume do that? Jim Hume. The health, the, the health Cabinet Secretary isn't recognising that spending has grown in the rest of the UK but has fallen here, hasn't answered fully on the nine out of the 14 health boards. The NHS Grampian remains at nearly £17 million short of its funding share. The news is worse for mental health. In any month, half of the boards aren't meeting the target. Mental ill health affects so many people and deserves to be taken more seriously. Why has the share of the mental health bu budget fallen in each of the last five years? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, on mental health, uh, Jim Hume will be aware that Jamie Hepburn announced a £100 million additional resource for mental health going forward. He mentioned Grampian. Grampian received the highest level of increase of any mainland board. Perhaps when Labour and the Liberal Democrats had been in power, if they had fixed the allocation formula to boards, then NHS Grampian might not have had the big distance to make up that it had. All boards will be within 1% of parity and we have made that commitment we will keep that commitment on health resource consequentials from the UK government that Jim Hume touched upon and every single year since 2010 every penny of that health a consequential resource has been passed on and indeed in 2015-16 we added an additional £54 million. I accept there are challenges in our NHS but what I will not accept is any inference whatsoever that this government has not given every penny of resource uh, 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 consequentials to health. We have protected the health budget and we have made sure that boards have had uplifts that have been, made them able to, uh, to take forward the improvements in patient care and safety that they need to make. I am very conscious of time, which is extremely tight for the whole afternoon. Uh, to get in as many people as I can, could you please keep to one question and keep it brief, Jo McAlpine? Yes, thank you. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell us exactly how the health resource budget of the NHS has changed since the last election and what has been the change to the Scottish Government's resource budget from Westminster over this same period? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I just uh, in my last answer um, made it very, very clear that every penny Every penny of health resource consequentials has been passed on, plus an additional £54 million. But what is absolutely clear is that the capital budget to this government has been reduced by 25%. Uh, it is therefore clear that that was going to have uh, an impact uh, on the, the uh, capital spend of this government. But every penny of resource spend has been passed on. And also, I should add that the percentage share of health um, that, uh, of the Scottish Government budget has increased every single year and is a far higher share now than it was under the previous administration. Richard Simpson. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I think we're all having some difficulty with these figures and it really would be good to clarify them because the last two years of the Labour Government there were increases of 6.2% and 5.2% in the health spend. Therefore, to hear that there has been a reduction of 0.7%, albeit including the significant capital reduction, is extremely worrying. And I think that we need to get this clarified by an independent resource source. But can I ask about the fact that there is still one third of the NHS estate not fit for purpose, and that the targets that were set by the government for the elimination of high-risk high risk maintenance backlog has not been reached. Uh, this is really very worrying indeed because these are significant uh, elements. Will she agree to undertake to place in spice a detailed interim report before the next report in March from each health board on the progress being made on the high risk backlog maintenance? Well, I can assure Richard Simpson that uh, we keep a very close eye on the high-risk backlog maintenance, but of course he will have to recognise, as others will have to recognise, that a 25% cut to the capital budget has implications for all of the capital spend across the whole of the Scottish Government, including health capital. But he should surely recognise that on page 10 of the Audit Scotland report, it absolutely says in black and white that the resource spending for the NHS has increased in real terms. If you take that to 15-16, in 15-16 prices, it increases by 5.8%. So I accept that capital has been challenging, and of course each year capital fluctuates uh, within health as it does within other capital budgets. So I hope Richard Simpson will take the assurance, because it is there in black and white in the Audit Scotland report on page 10. Nanette Milne. Thank you. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary knows that we all support an integrated health and social care system. However, the RCGP tells us that general practice funding has fallen from 9.8% of NHS fund spending in 2005-06 to 7.6% in 13-14. And budget freezes this year have meant an inflationary loss of 1.2% for general medical services. Audit Scotland uh, and other figures from the 
RCGP, highlight that more needs to be done to make an integrated health and social care system possible. Can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary what long-term action the Government is taking to reverse these trends and to prevent predicted repercussions to ensure that we do, in fact, achieve an integrated health and social care system? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Nan Nanette Milne makes a, a not unreasonable point that uh, if you look at uh, primary care going forward and the, the reforms and the modernisation of primary care that we need to make, then that will require us uh, to look at the appropriate resourcing of uh, primary care in order to deliver those reforms. But we have made a good start on that, so a good start with the £60 million investment over the next three years to kick-start that reform. We've announced that the, the, there will be a new contract based around um, a different set of principles moving away from the core from 2017 onwards and of course the transitional year we've already dismantled or will dismantle large parts of the COF to reduce uh, bureaucracy and of course the First Minister has announced a, a substantial increase in the number of GP training uh, places so all of that I think should indicate to Nanette Milne and others that we um, absolutely recognise the need to do more in primary care in order to be able to keep people out of our hospitals safely in their own homes and treated in their own homes. Neil Finbar. The Children's Ward at uh, uh, St John's Hospital is under review uh, and struggles to recruit staff. Why then is there a recruitment freeze at NHS Lothian? And will the Cabinet Secretary be, uh, be doing anything about it? And can she also say why there is a 53 per cent increase in the number of agency uh, nurses being used? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I certainly am very uh, closely uh, involved in, uh, with NHS Lothian around the issue of St John's and the review is, as the member will know, is looking at uh, a pan-Lothian approach to that because of the difficulty in recruiting uh, paediatric special, spe specialities, not just to St John's but across uh, many other uh, parts of Scotland as well. So he can be assured that uh, I am absolutely keeping a very close eye on that. But he mentioned agency spend and that's very interesting because uh, I don't know if the member is aware but uh, agency spend uh, under the previous administration the last, the last three years of the previous administration, you spent more on agency spend than in the whole of our time in administration. Wow. Three wow. years. Three years you spent more on agency spend than in eight years under this government. And in fact, your last year in office, you spent two and a half million pounds more than Jackie Bailey was attacking me for in her press release. So I think you really ought to look at your own history before you start throwing brickbats at our NHS. Question number two, Sandra White. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of their accident investigation branch reporting to the helicopter crash at the Clutha Vaults, what steps it can take to bring closure for the families involved? Cabinet Secretary Michael Mathis. Uh, our thoughts continue to be with the families and friends of those who lost their lives in the Clutha tragedy, and the Scottish Government once again offers its deepest condolences to them. I share the disappointment of the families that the AIB report does not provide the closure they sought. After two years of investigation, the report does not reach a clearer conclusion and raises more questions than answers. The Crown confirmed last week that, as the incident involved death in the course of employment, a fatal accident inquiry is mandatory, and this will be held as soon as possible. This will allow for a wider reflection on some of the other issues that could have impacted on the events that evening. What is clear, however, is that without a flight data recorder in the helicopter, something not required by regulation for the size of the helicopter required, it will be very difficult to fully establish all of the answers. While well, the issue of helicopter safety is reserved to Westminster, the Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure and myself have contacted the Secretary of State for Transport, seeking reassurance that the UK Government that it will ensure that the report's recommendations are taken forward swiftly. Sandra White. Uh, thank you. I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply, and I do welcome the announcement that a fatal accident inquiry will be undertaken, and I do hope it will provide answers for the families that are involved and the answers that they deserve. The Cabinet Secretary member, uh, mentioned previous AIB reports. 
But there are uh, you know, previous reports stretching back over 10 years, uh, which recommend that flight data and recording equipment should be fitted to all aircraft, and yet they have never been implemented. I take on board what the Cabinet Secretary said about speaking with Westminster counterparts, but is there something else we can do from the Scottish Government to help the people here who are suffering and have no answers yet? Cabinet Secretary. I am aware of the reports which the member makes reference to. You should be aware there are two different aspects to the regulation in this particular area. Uh, there is an aspect which is regulated through legislation, which is the European Aviation Safety Agency, that is responsible for the pan-European safety approach to uh, aircraft uh, safety. And there is also the domestic regulator through the Civil Aviation Authority as well. Uh, we are now in a situation where uh, we want to see the recommendations from the AIB report taken forward swiftly. They fall in part both to the CAA and also to the European Aviation uh, Safety Regulator. What we want to do is to make sure that all action that can be taken is taken forward as swiftly as possible. And that is why we are engaged with our counterparts at the UK Government level to ensure that the regulators and also the European Agency are considering these matters timelessly and also that they act on the recommendations quickly as well. Ms White. I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary and his support for the recommendations to be implemented and action to be taken. Uh, but the Cabinet Secretary will know that the manufacturers had been aware that operators were periodically returning defective EC135 fuel sensors and that after the tragic accident had begun with a series of modifications to the EC135 fuel system, does he share my concerns that this potentially defective system could be apparent in other helicopters of the same design? And will he support calls for all similar helicopters to be examined for any such defects? Cabinet Secretary. Well, yes, I do share the member's concern on these matters, and I think it is important that the issue of uh, public safety is absolutely of paramount importance in these matters, and I would expect all actions to be taken to address any issues which have been highlighted which may prove to be uh, defective around the operating systems within uh, this type of aircraft or any other type of aircraft. As the member will recognise, these are matters which are the responsibility of the regulators to ensure that manufacturers and operators are adhering to them appropriately and that they are taking timely action in dealing with any issues that may arise from modifications which are required. But clearly, some of these are issues which can be explored further in a fatal accident inquiry once it has been constituted. And I've got no doubt that I would want to ensure that all of these types of issues are given the opportunity to be explored in that particular environment. But I would expect that public safety is of absolute, impact, of absolute importance in these matters and that all of those who are stakeholders in air safety are taking forward appropriate measures to address any issues that are highlighted. Bruce Smith, briefly. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer, uh, and thank you to the Cabinet Secretary for the answers he's already given. Is there any reason why operators of helicopters could, uh, uh, could not look to install recorders in advance of uh, the regulation that he speaks about uh, being brought into force? Cabinet Secretary. Well, part of the distinction here is the nature of the regulation of these different flights. So, for example, the emergency medical flights are under a different regulation. They're regulated by the legislation that's set by the European uh, 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 aircraft, uh, the European uh, Safety Agency, whereas uh, police helicopters and police flights are classed as state flights and they're regulated by the CAA. So there are slight differences for the different regulators and the roles which they have in these particular matters. What I can assure the member of is that government we are looking at every avenue that is open to us to look at what further measures need to be taken in relation to those that operate in Scottish contracts uh, to ensure that the recommendations that have been set by the AIB are being implemented swiftly. Thank you. The next item of business is a statement by Fergus Ewing on the future of the Scottish steel industry. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement and there should therefore be no interruption.